Arriving at Parliament Buildings, Wellington, is the Governor-General, Sir Bernard Freiburg, with Lady Freiburg, his personal staff, and the Chiefs of Services. It's the opening of the 28th New Zealand Parliament, and for the first time in the history of the ceremony, the Guard of Honour is drawn from the RNZAF. The new Parliament will bring to light many points of great political interest, and included in the Cabinet is the new Minister of Health, Miss Mabel Howard. The opening of Parliament has brought home to me very forcibly the great honour that has been done to the women of New Zealand by my appointment to Cabinet rank. In the fields of health and education, women are strongly represented and they have made a valuable contribution to our national development. In the House itself, I am very happy to be occupying the seat which was occupied by my father as Chairman of Committees in the first New Zealand Labour government. My colleagues have entrusted to me a big portfolio and one which affects the women and children particularly. And I can only say that I will do my utmost to justify their trust and show that the appointment of a woman to the Cabinet of New Zealand is fully justified. The children of Masterton are helping the children of Europe. 1,500 parcels of food and soap and clothing have been gathered together for dispatch to Holland and Greece. The children's contribution is only part of the total effort being made by Masterton people to send quantities of food and clothing. This is a 100% voluntary effort, and after the Boy Scouts have loaded the truck, the parcels go on their way in the first stage of their long journey to Europe. The worst flood since 1897 spread across the plains of the southern Wairarapa. 30,000 acres of farmlands are underwater, and the losses of crops and stock have been appalling. Drowned sheep cover the paddocks as the floodwaters recede. These two farmers had their land completely flooded. They'll be glad to learn of the government's plan to compensate flood victims. But money cannot replace meat in a world so badly in need of food. Taking a boat, a couple of farmers go out to see whether their stock have survived the disaster. Some of their cattle are safe, isolated on a rise. Flood waters have begun to recede, but the farmers of the Wairarapa have a hard year ahead of them as they face the tremendous task of restoring their land. In the South Island, electric power is in short supply. Lake Coleridge Power Station, which has supplied Christchurch since 1914, is threatened with a shutdown owing to shortage of water. To save the water, drastic power cuts have had to be imposed over most of the South Island. Water comes from Lake Coleridge, but with one of the driest autumns in memory, the lake is dangerously low and wide shingled beaches are exposed. Also exposed are the intakes of the tunnel that pipes water down to the powerhouse. The normal watermark shows near the top of the groin wall, while 10 feet in the air is a cable that the water lapped only last February. Now a bulldozer shifting shingle from the intake can pass under it. Winter will bring little relief to Coleridge, for here winter means snow, not rain. Not till the snow melts on the Alps in the early summer will Coleridge have water to spare. The dry autumn has also had its effects on the Waitaki power system. Lake Tekapo, one of the reservoirs for Waitaki, is well below normal. Low lakes mean low rivers, and low rivers, idle generators. Here the gauge is almost out of the water. At Pukaki, another of the Waitaki reservoirs, is the same story. It too is snow fed, and not till the snow melts in the summer will lake and river be full again. The same is true of the Ohau, the third stream which feeds the Waitaki. With so little water, Waitaki power station is barely keeping going. A gauge nearly out of the water and a dry spillway point the story of water shortage. But it will not always be like this. At Tekapo, a scheme is on the way which will dam the river and increase the storage capacity of the lake. 
the lake level will be raised 15 feet. The lake outflow will be piped through a 5,000 foot tunnel, now being driven from the lake's edge. This will enable the flow of water to be controlled according to Waitaki's requirements. In addition, the water will drive a 25,000 kilowatt power station at the foot of the tunnel. The Tekapo scheme is a major undertaking. A large factory has been erected for the making of concrete blocks for the tunnel lining, and it operates three shifts and 24 hours a day. Construction methods are unique here. For the tunnel driving, driving shields are being used on both faces of the tunnel and erector arms for block laying. The erector arm can swing the one-ton blocks through a complete circle and lays every block in its exact position. A fresh ring of blocks is laid every 18 hours. When in position, each block is bolted to its neighbors. Inside the front of the driving shield, seven tunnelers dig into the face. Here too, three shifts work 24 hours a day, and already they're a quarter of the way through. It will not be until 1950, however, that the Tekapo scheme will come into operation. More men would speed up the job, but here a housing problem arises. Providing accommodation in this remote spot is difficult, and more houses are being built as fast as possible. At Pukaki, another lake level control scheme is nearing completion. Here the lake outflow will be diverted through five sluices, and the lake level raised 18 feet. This will enable surplus summer water to be stored for Waitaki's winter requirements. The sluices will be finished in September, and the water can be stored during the coming summer. The Pukaki storage scheme means more water for Waitaki. At present, there's only enough water to drive two of its four generators full time. Next winter will be different, but even then the South Island will not have a surplus of power. This is not likely until Tekapo is finished in three years' time, and meanwhile, demand keeps catching up on supply.